The Texas Constitution is 143 years old. In 18, early 1876, the Texas voters approved the new Constitution by a margin of 2 to 1. Since the adoption of our current Texas Constitution in 1876, the legislature has proposed 680 amendments, and of those, 498 have been approved by the electorate, and 179 have been defeated. You can find a link to this particular document uh, below this YouTube video. Our legislature proposes amendments to our Texas Constitution every odd-numbered year, and sometimes also in even-numbered years. Now, there are a few reasons why the Texas Constitution is amended. First, the Constitution can only be amended if a proposal receives a two-thirds approval vote from both legislative chambers. That's a minimum of 100 votes in the House of Representatives and 21 votes in the Senate, and then placed on a statewide ballot and passed by 50% plus one of the Texans that show up and vote. The last time Texas voters showed up to amend our Constitution in 2017, less than 6% showed up. So, less than 6% of Texas voters decide things like how much more debt Texans will absorb. That's not even 50% of the voters making important financial decisions for you. Now, the reasons for a Texas Constitution Amendment are if the Constitution prohibits an action, you must amend it to make the action possible. And not all amendments are necessary. But by putting legislation in the Constitution makes changing or repealing it harder. Once it's in the Constitution, it must then be put before the voters to change or remove it. And then getting voters to approve of legislative action, especially if it involves spending money, provides political cover for the legislature in their next election campaign. And here's one conversation that I had with my former House representative. Representative, why did you vote for all of these amendments on the House floor? And her response was, well, so that you can decide whether it belongs in the Constitution by casting a ballot in November, to which I cried baloney. In essence, what she was saying is that she would vote for a proposed Constitution amendment on the ballot to repeal the First or Second Amendment just so that I could decide by casting a ballot. I expect my elected officials to vote on their principles. I should be able to look at each of their recorded votes and decide if I should re-elect them or not. That is one of the only benefits of re-electing an incumbent. You have their voting record to tell you if they actually support their campaign platform. And then last, there are unnecessary proposals that have to do with the human emotion like puppy dogs. And let's not forget forced government charity, which is easy to support if it's other people's money, right? Other amendments also provide for good campaign stunt material in the next election cycle, as you will see. Now, I have three questions that I ask myself when filtering the information within any legislation, whether it be city council, school board, county commissioner, Texas legislators, or the federal beast. I also apply these questions to the Texas Constitution Amendments. And notice that I call them Constitution Amendments and not Constitutional Amendments because many are not constitutional, just as some laws are not lawful. You can read my reasons for using these three questions in the link below this YouTube video. I briefly explained the principles of life, liberty, and property, and it should be the basis of these principles that provide the grounds for each of the ten proposed amendments. And those questions are, is it constitutional? Does it support our constitutional republic? Is there a need? Do all the people have a need for and benefit from the proposed government intervention? and affordability. Can the people afford it and is the cost equal and uniform? Today I will look at also the enabling legislation behind these proposed amendments which are necessary to activate each proposed change in the Constitution. And unless I state otherwise, the enabling legislation does not go into effect until the Constitution amendment is passed by the voters at the ballot box in November. And if the amendment fails at the ballot box, the enabling legislation also dies. In addition to applying three questions to each proposed amendment, I will show you the few names of the legislators who voted against any of these amendments or the enabling legislation. If you don't see their names listed, you can presume that they voted for the amendment or the legislation. And I encourage you to reach out to your elected officials and talk about their votes. The primary elections are just a few months away. I've done the research on the votes for you. All you need to do is pick up the phone, and here's the question to answer in March of 2020. 
Is my legislator worth re-electing or not? I hope you are involved enough to know who your Texas House Rep and Texas Senator is so that my research on these votes will be beneficial to you. So, let's dig into the 10 proposed Constitution Amendments. For each of the 10 propositions, I'm going to begin with the full wording that will be on your November ballot. <clears throat> Proposition 1, the ballot will read, the Constitutional Amendment permitting a person to hold more than one office as a municipal judge at the same time. The relative action that we're addressing here is appointed versus elected municipal judges. The Texas Constitution generally prohibits a person from holding more than one paid public office at the same time. However, there are numerous exceptions for certain offices. Government Code 574 allows a person to be appointed to the office of municipal judge for more than one municipality at the same time. That's appointed. Proposition 1 would amend the Texas Constitution to allow a municipal judge to serve in more than one municipality regardless of whether elected or appointed to each office. The enabling legislation, House Bill 1717, will amend the government code to allow the same. This would make it easier for smaller municipalities to fill these judgeships with qualified members of their community or a nearby community. If this amendment passes, Section 574 of the Government Code is amended to read as follows. A person may hold the office of municipal judge for more than one municipality at the same time. So my three questions. Is it constitutional? Does it support our constitutional republic? I say yes. Increasing the pool of candidates for the people to elect as municipal judge can't be wrong in a republic. Now. I don't agree that most Texans should be able to vote, but that's another issue. Question two, is there a need? Do all the people have a need for and benefit from the proposed government intervention? I say yes, specifically in rural, sparsely populated municipalities with fewer or no qualified residents. This change should have no impact on the cities with higher populations. And affordability, can the people afford it? Is the cost equal and uniform? I say yes, each municipality is still able to choose whether to elect or appoint their municipal judges so the cost of elections would be the only fiscal note of consideration. Now, both the proposition and the enabling legislation passed unanimously in each chamber, meaning that your state rep and state senator voted for both the proposition and also the enabling legislation that will become statute if Prop 1 passes in November. So moving on to proposition number two, the ballot will read, the constitutional amendment providing for the issuance of additional general obligation bonds by the Texas Water Development Board in an amount not to exceed $200 million to provide financial assistance for the development of certain projects in economically distressed areas. <clears throat> Here's a 2019 map of the counties involved in the Economically Distressed Area Program, or EDAP, for short. The green counties are receiving EDAP funding. The pink counties have filed for and qualify for EDAP funding. Since the 1950s, people have been settling on property outside of cities, living without basic infrastructure called colonias, which means neighborhood in Spanish. These are predominantly unincorporated areas, and most of these more than 2,000 colonia settlements are without water and sewage systems, electricity, and paved roads. County and state regulations did not require developers to provide basic services if the land didn't exceed a certain number of lots. Then in the early 1990s, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Agriculture officially recognized colonias as neighborhoods within 150 miles of the border that lack some basic utilities. The National, Affordi the National Affordable Housing Act of 1990 required that all the border states set aside a percentage of community development block grants for colonias. So here we are, 30 years later, and the colonias continue to grow, and taxpayers are asked to continue funding this increase in the colonias. In 1989, the Texas Legislature established the Economically Distressed Areas Program, or EDAP, under the control of the Texas Water Development Board. These EDAP Texas EDAP provides financial assistance for projects to develop water and wastewater services in economically distressed areas where these services or facilities are inadequate to meet minimum state standards. An economically distressed area is defined as 
a political subdivision in which the median income level is less than 75% of the state's median income level. Well, the state median income in Texas was 59000 in 2017. So a political subdivision with a median income under 44000 qualifies for EDAP funding. EDAP initially was funded through $250 million in general obligation bonds approved by voters in 1989. Then in 2007, voters approved another $250 million in general obligation bonds. Plus, the Texas Water Development Board has utilized an additional $199 million from non-EDAP programs out of the state's general revenue, and plus the feds have funded EDAP communities. So <clears throat> here's the list of nay votes. If your state house representative is not listed here, then they voted for Proposition 2. Proposition 2 received a fair amount of resistance in both the House and the Senate. Looking at the House first, here are the 27 nay votes in the House, all being Republicans. <clears throat> and for the enabling legislation that amends state statutes if Prop 2 passes in November, that's Senate Bill 2452, there were 41 nay votes in the House, as shown here again, all Republicans. Now, looking at the Senate, here are the eight nay votes on Proposition 2, all Republicans. And the ten nay votes on the same enabling legislation, all Republicans. This proposed Constitution Amendment is the only proposal authored by the Democrats. The other nine are from the Republicans. So on to my three questions. Is it constitutional? Does it support our constitutional republic? I say no. Taking money from Texas taxpayers to provide entitlements to others is communist and antithetical to a republic. Is there a need? Do all the people have a need for and benefit from the proposed government intervention? No, only those who made a decision to settle on a plot of land that has no sanitation services. Other communities tax their residents to pay for these same services, continuing to tax the incomes of all Texans to promote dependent lifestyles for others is counterproductive to liberty. Is it affordable? Can all the people afford it? And is the cost equal and uniform? No. Any increase in taxes is unaffordable, and some of these bonds don't have to be paid back, leaving Texas taxpayers holding the debt. So, on to Proposition number 3, the Constitutional Amendment authorizing the legislature to provide for a temporary local option exemption from ad valorem taxation of a portion of the appraised value of certain property damaged by a disaster. Note the phrase, local option exemption, meaning the exemption from property taxes is optional, not mandatory, as I will explain. <clears throat> On February 5th of 2019, Governor Abbott declared disaster response to be an emergency item, citing Hurricane Harvey as justification. He said, quote, To give the legislature time this session to make Texas more resilient to future disasters, I am making disaster response an emergency item, close quote. Under Proposition 3, a governing body of a taxing unit may adopt a temporary property tax exemption to property declared a disaster by the governor. This passive exemption comes with time and assessment restrictions. Presuming this proposition passes, if a political subdivision does take advantage of this process, then it must do so within 60 days of the, de of the governor's declaration. Then there are time requirements for the property owner to apply for the exemption depending on certain property criteria. The legislature prescribes the method of determining the amount and duration of the exemption as well as any additional eligibility requirements. The county appraiser will still assess the level of damage, level 1, 2, 3, or 4, and be in charge of accepting applications from qualifying property owners within the applicable taxing units. If Prop 3 passes, House Bill 492, the enabling legislation, will amend the Texas Tax Code to provide for the property exemption levels. If this amendment passes, those levels will be what you see here on the screen, level 1, 2, 3, and 4. Generally speaking, this temporary tax exemption from ad valorem taxes for a qualifying structure will be 12 months or less. And since these exemption levels will be in statute and not in the Constitution, future legislatures can change the exemption levels, the qualifying parameters, and the length of property tax exemptions. Supporters of this amendment say that taxpayers are more familiar with an exemption than with reappraisals, and an exemption would provide taxpayers with more immediate relief. 
Opponents say the amendment would not go far enough in providing property tax relief to taxpayers following a disaster and that any such relief should be mandatory, not passive. I have been recommending that people contact uh, people that they may know in Harris County down in the Houston area <clears throat> or the area uh, to the uh, east of that where uh, Tropical Storm Amelda hit and talk to them about how these uh, property exemptions uh, or reappraisals rather how they go and if they approve of this particular proposition. So on to my three questions. Is it constitutional? Property taxes are antithetical to our republic, but any move toward reduction or elimination does support a constitutional republic. Is there a need? Do all the people have a need for and benefit from the proposed government intervention? Well, unless the cost of government services and expenses will be eliminated proportionate to the percentage of property tax decrease, any property owners not receiving an exemption within the same taxing district will absorb the cost to make up the lost revenue to the taxing unit in the tax year that the exemptions are taken. Is it affordable? Can all the people afford it and is the cost equal and uniform? I say no, the cost is not equal unless every structure in the specific taxing district is affected. This proposed amendment and its enabling legislation was approved without any nay votes in either chamber. So moving on to Proposition 4, the constitutional amendment prohibiting the imposition of an individual income tax, including a tax on an individual share of partnership and unincorporated association income. Now, there's been a considerable amount of false and confusing chatter on social media about Proposition 4, and to me it's very obvious that the intent of the chatter is to keep Proposition 4 from passing. So let me explain the basic facts of Proposition 4 first. The ballot will read vote for or against and not yes or no. If Prop 4 passes on November 5th, this is what the Texas Constitution will then say. As you see it on the screen, the legislature may not impose a tax on the net incomes of individuals, including an individual's share of partnership and unincorporated association income. Now I'm going to give you some more details about what else Prop 4 will do. <clears throat> this is the wording in the current Texas Constitution that addresses a state income tax. I've highlighted keywords, and so I'll read them. A law imposing a tax on incomes of natural persons, including a person's share of partnership and unincorporated association income, must be approved by a majority of the registered voters voting in a statewide referendum and specify the rate of the tax. So currently, a state income tax on individual income is not prohibited by the Texas Constitution. Rather, this part of the Constitution allows the legislature to impose a net income tax on certain incomes, but only if approved by a majority of the registered voters that show up and vote in a statewide referendum, meaning at the ballot box. Now, if the Democrats take majority control of the state legislature again, and our Texas Secretary of State's Elections Administrator continues to tell all 254 Texas County voter registrars to issue a voter certificate to everyone who applies without checking citizenship, then we could be looking at an individual state income tax in the not-so-distant future if it is put to a vote at the ballot box. But if Prop 4 passes, this whole section on the screen is repealed. That's actually two pages of text that will be repealed by Proposition 4. All of Section 24 is about two pages. And I'll summarize the language that will be repealed with the passage of Prop 4. Prop 4, if passed, will also remove current text in the Constitution that allows the state to impose a progressive income tax consistent with federal law, as well as an ad valerum or direct property tax for maintenance and operation of local public schools. That tax could be in addition to the school property tax that you already pay now. You can read the entire text of Section 24 that will be repealed by reading my article linked below this YouTube video. So if Prop 4 passes, all two pages of Section 24 is repealed and replaced with this short sentence. The legislature may not impose a tax on the net incomes of individuals, including an individual's share of partnership and unincorporated association income. 
I would like this amendment more if they had worded it shall not instead of may not. Prop 4 was passed with the Republicans voting for it. In the House, it passed 142 with 20 Democrats also voting for it. In the Senate, it passed 22 to 9 with three Democrats voting for it. And if you recall, the two-thirds minimum vote required for a proposed Constitution amendment to appear on the November ballot equals 100 votes in the House and 21 votes in the Senate. This amendment did not require any enabling legislation to change the tax code. So, on to my three questions. Is it constitutional? I say yes. Income taxes are antithetical to liberty and individual freedom, especially the Marxist progressive income tax. Prohibiting such tax supports a republic. Is there a need? I say yes. Most, if not all, Texans can appreciate less legalized government theft. Is it affordable? Yes. The absence of a state income tax is equal for every individual. Proposition 5. The ballot will read, the constitutional amendment dedicating the revenue re received from the existing state sales and use taxes that are imposed on sporting goods to the Texas Park and Wildlife and the Texas Historical Commission to protect Texas natural areas, water quality, and history by acquiring, managing, and improving state and local parks and historic sites while not increasing the rate of the state sales and use taxes. Currently, the Texas tax code already requires 94% of the sporting goods tax proceeds to be credited to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, while 6% is credited to the Texas Historical Commission, but reportedly not all of the generated taxes have been appropriated this way. Proposition 5 would amend the Texas Constitution to automatically appropriate these taxes collected beginning in September of 2021. But here's the information that legislators won't tell you. Proposition 5, if passed, will put it in the Constitution to allow the legislature to reduce this automatic appropriation by up to 50% with a two-thirds vote from each chamber. The ballot says dedicating the revenue received. Most voters perceive dedicated to mean all of the revenue. As the proposition, Senate Joint Resolution 24, was originally filed and passed in the Senate, it did dedicate all of the tax revenue from sporting goods to the Texas Parks and Water Department and uh, the Texas Historical Commission. After it passed the Senate, Senate Joint Resolution 24 then proceeded over to the House. House Representative Serrier, the sponsor, for whatever reason, chose to skip the amendment proposed in uh, chose to skip the amendment proposal in the House Committee hearing, and instead chose to tack his amendment onto SJR 24 on the House floor, which was late in the session and on a busy day on the House floor when no one was paying attention, which is just another beef that I have with how sausage is made under the dome. The Serie Amendment turned Senate Joint Resolution 24 on its head, removing the dedication and specifically stating that the legislature can reduce the funding by 50%, in other words, direct the funds elsewhere. You can read that amendment in the link listed below this video. What Syria should have done with this floor amendment is include verbiage to change the ballot wording to include the legislature's ability to reduce the dedicated amount by 50% with a two-thirds vote. And why did the Senate vote to accept Syria's amendment? Maybe because the clock ran out. Senate Bill 26, the enabling legislation, would allow sporting goods sales tax to be used for new additional purposes such as funding of these three areas out of the Parks and Wildlife Department's 94% share. Those items are debt service on park-related bonds, benefit-related costs of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department employees, and fund certain benefit programs under the Employees Retirement System of Texas. Of the 6% that goes to the Historical Commission, the amendment would make the separate historic site account a, quote, dedicated account within the general revenue account. <clears throat> this is the fiscal note prediction from the Legislative Budget Board if Prop 5 passes. The negative impact to the State General Revenue Fund is shown here. There was one loan nay vote on Proposition 5, that of Representative Jonathan Stickland of Bedford, but not a single nay vote on the enabling legislation. Is it constitutional? I say yes. 
Many of our state parks are located on land that is uninhabitable, such as floodplains or areas or other areas acquired through eminent domain to create water reservoirs. Such areas serve millions of Texans with not only potable water, but recreation, hunting, and natural habitat for a variety of wildlife. Such activities are not possible for most smaller uh, municipalities or districts to create and sustain, thus the state acts in this area and applies certain sales tax collected from goods related to sports and outdoors. Also of great importance is preservation of our state historic sites and markers. Is there a need? Yes, for the same reasons that it's constitutional. Is it affordable? Well, yes, since we're only talking about sales tax and a small amount of lost revenue to the state's general revenue fund, the current benefits outweigh lost revenue. However, it should be noted that the amendment is written to grant the legislature power to reduce the amounts appropriated this way by up to 50% with a two-thirds majority vote in each chamber. So moving on to Proposition 6. <clears throat> the constitutional amendment authorizing the legislature to increase by $3 billion the maximum bond amount authorized for the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. In 2007, voters approved a Constitution Amendment creating the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas, and with that, we approved issuance of state debt to the tune of $3 billion total, with a maximum of $3 million ish issued each year. So here we are 12 years later, and the legislature wants to double that debt to $6 billion. We voters must make the final decision. The Texas Health and Safety Code explains the purpose of CPRIT this way, to create, an expedite, to create and expedite innovation of cancer research, enhancing potential for medical and scientific breakthrough in prevention and cures for cancer, and to attract, create, or expand research capabilities of public or private institutions of higher education and other public or private entities that will promote a substantial increase in cancer research and in the creation of high quality new jobs in this state. And CPRIT is currently subject to the Texas Sunset Act and it is set to expire September of 2023. <clears throat> is it constitutional? Well, yes, if you believe that taxpayers should fund research through more public debt and support government choosing the winners and losers. No, if you believe that research should be funded through the private, free market, and university endowments. Is there a need? Do all the people have a need for and benefit from the proposed government intervention? No, CPRIT does not fund many holistic, non-pharmaceutical, non-surgical cancer cures that have shown great success rates such as the alternative therapies used at the Brzezinski Clinic in Houston, which for 40 years has shown success through targeted immunotherapy. As a matter of fact, the Texas Medical Board has sued Brzezinski half a dozen times in an effort to shut him down. So how many other free market research clinics have been shunted to protect the government favored big pharma research? Is it affordable? No, funding of CPRIT is based on Texas taxpayers funding additional debt for government to choose winners and losers. According to the Legislative Budget Board, the amendment would have a two year estimated cost of about $12.5 million in general revenue related funds for debt service payments through fiscal 2020 to 2021. <clears throat> Prop 6 passed unanimously 31 to 0 in the Senate, but in the House it passed 130 to 15. The 15 nay votes in the House are listed here. They are all Republicans. There's not any enabling legislation specifically listed for me to mention. On to Proposition 7. The Constitutional Amendment allowing increased distributions to the available school fund. I'll give a brief explanation of the available school fund, or ASF, and the permanent school fund, or PSF. The PSF is a perpetual endowment for the public schools of this state, and it was set up in our 1876 Texas Constitution. It consists of state-owned assets in the form of land, minerals, and investments from the sale of these items. Annually, proceeds are moved from the PSF to the Available School Fund, or the ASF, to be appropriated by the legislature for government education. And just so you know, the ASF is funded through a variety of sales taxes, too, but we're not going to get into that. 
So this proposed amendment deals with increasing the amount of funds transferred from the PSF into the ASF and also expands who can direct those revenues. This is the exact wording of the amendment to the Texas Constitution. The underlying text is the proposed new language and strike through text is proposed deletions. So I'll read aloud how the Constitution will read if this proposition passes. Notwithstanding any other provision of this Constitution or of a statute, the State Board of Education, the General Land Office, or another entity that has responsibility for the management of revenues derived from permanent school fund land or other properties may, in its sole discretion, and in addition to other distributions authorized under this Constitution or a statute, distribute to the available school fund each year revenue derived during that year from the land or properties not to exceed $600 million by each entity each year. Notice the underlying text on the last line, $600 million by each entity each year. Proposition 7 will more than double the distributions from the PSF to the ASF. The bill author, Representative Huberty, who is also chair of the House Public Education Committee, added a last-minute floor amendment to this proposition and put this wording into it, each entity. Every newsletter that I've read from my legislator and many others fail to inform voters of this change. Again, you can read this in my article listed below. So in summary, this amendment and the enabling legislation, House Bill 4611, will remove the current prohibition of the State Board of Education to make direct distributions to the ASF, and it will specifically grant them with this authority along with other entities. It will authorize each approved entity to make a direct distribution to ASF up to $600 million annually, and it will increase the previous cap on each distribution to $600 million from the previous cap of $300 million. There was very little discussion in committee hearings on this proposition and its enabling legislation, House Bill 4611. Also disappointing was the fact that there was absolutely no discussion on the floor of either the House or the Senate before voting to pass both the proposition and the enabling legislation. But there were a few nay votes in the House as seen on this screen. Both the proposition and the enabling legislation passed 31 to 0 in the Senate. The question, is it constitutional? Yes, the 1876 Texas Constitution set up a perpetual public school fund to which up to one-fourth of the state's general revenue was set aside. The fund later became known as the Permanent School Fund. A state school property tax was added 100 years later in 1883, and then, of course, the local school property tax. The PSF is managed by a board appointed by the General Land Commissioner, that's George P. Bush currently. For your information, the fund is worth $44 billion today. I could support this amendment if the state would stop accepting the unconstitutional federal money with their Marxist programs that have ruined our schools. And since our government schools do such a horrible job and my local taxes are way out of control, I don't support giving the government schools any more money until they return to good academic immersion. Is there a need? No. Our schools, just like all departments of today's government, or most of them, don't have a funding problem. They have a spending problem. If the state would eliminate the addiction to federal education funds and their required Marxist programs, I could get excited about supporting our public schools financially again. Is it affordable? Yes, this doesn't affect property taxes, just the balance held in the permanent school fund. Now, if the permanent school fund runs dry, the feds will then own your public schools outright. Proposition 8 reads, The Constitutional Amendment providing for the creation of the Flood Infrastructure Fund to assist in the financing of drainage, flood mitigation, and flood control projects. There was unanimous support of this proposition in both the House and the Senate. Not a single nay vote was recorded. This proposition is also in response to the governor's request for disaster response legislation. So here's the background. 
federal funds are available for flood projects after disastrous events, but count counties and cities may not be able to put up the matching funds necessary to access that federal money. Because of that, federal money has been left on the table. The Flood Infrastructure Fund, or FIF, that will be created by Proposition 8 will take money from the Texas Economic Stabilization Fund, or ESF, also known as the Rainy Day Fund. The ESF was created in 1988 and is funded primarily with taxes on oil and gas production. The newly created FIF would provide loans at or below market rates to help local governments meet matching fund needs and assist with basic flood project planning, grant applications, and the engineering of structural and non-structural flood mitigation projects. The FIF would be a special fund in the state treasury outside the general revenue fund. As provided by the enabling legislation, the fund will be administered and controlled by the Texas Water Development Board. The three-member Water Development Board is appointed by the governor, and that was created in 1957. Senate Bill 7, the enabling legislation for Proposition 8, would appropriate $3.26 billion from the ESF to the FIF and also allocate the first three million of the maintenance taxes collected from insurance companies in Texas and deposit to this new FIF. Now I searched for bills that were passed just this past legislative session which specifically addressed the Water Development Board and I found 19 bills. Seven of them address flood mitigation and flood response. So, regardless of the successful passage of this proposition in November, flood control projects were not ignored this session. Is it constitutional? Yes. Government is instituted to protect individual property. Is there a need? Yes. Since floodwaters don't recognize the geographical boundaries of political subdivisions, the state assists in the coordination of efforts to mitigate flooding through expensive and often massive infrastructure projects. The Texas Water Development Board is the central agency for the planning and funding of projects. Reportedly, federal matching grant money is left on the table due to smaller communities' inability to meet certain criteria. However, one should seriously question the authority of the feds to fund local infrastructure with their unconstitutional mandates attached. I think most people remember the Federal Bureau of Land Management dispute with the state of Texas over the Red River boundaries and other situations as well. Question three, is it affordable? Well, yes, Proposition 8 will offer low or no interest loans through the Flood Infrastructure Fund. The Texas Water Development Board will offer assistance with federal grants and SB 7, the enabling legislation, will not only address flood mitigation but also water retention for areas that deal with drought. According to the Legislative Budget Board, Senate Bill 7 would have a negative impact of $5.8 million to general revenue-related funds through fiscal 2020 to 2021. The bill also would appropriate $3.26 billion from the Economic Stabilization Fund in fiscal 2020. Opponents to Proposition 8 say the ESF should only be used for disaster response or relief or for other one-time expenses. Since the FIF would be an ongoing state program, the money should come from the general revenue. Proposition 8 passed in both chambers without a single nay vote. There was one nay vote on the enabling legislation, and that was Jonathan Stickland of Bedford. So Proposition 9, the constitutional amendment authorizing the legislature to exempt from ad valorem taxation precious metal held in a precious metal depository located in this state. This proposition is authored by the same House representative who authored and passed the bill in 2015 which created the Texas Bullion Depository, that is Representative Giovanni Capriglioni from Tarrant County. This is the website for the Texas Bullion Depository. I recommend that you visit this website if you haven't already and Google Texas Bullion Depository and read the many articles about this return of gold bullion belonging to Texas from New York. Texas Constitution, Article 8, Section 1, requires all real and tangible personal property 
in the state to be taxed in proportion to its value unless exempt as required or permitted by the Constitution. Prop 9 would amend the Constitution by adding this section you see on the screen to the end of Article 8 in the Constitution, so let's read it. The legislature, by general law, may exempt from ad valerum taxation precious metal held in a precious metal depository located in this state. The legislature, by general law, may define precious metal and precious metal depository for purposes of this section. So like I said, in 2015, Texas was the first state to pass law to provide for a state-sanctioned bullion depository. A private company, Lone Star Tangible Assets, the chosen operator of the Texas Bullion Depository, is currently in the process, and I think they've already moved into, their new expanded facility in Leander, Texas, just north of Austin in Williamson County. This Constitution Amendment will help advertise the Bullion Depository's existence to Texans. And of course, gold and silver have always been considered legal tender, and the IRS doesn't tax possession of money. Texas shouldn't either. On the other hand, notice that the new text on this screen says the legislature may exempt precious metals, not shall. So putting this in the Constitution allows the legislature to tax precious metal by a simple majority vote in the legislature in the future. Also of concern is the text only mentions precious metal held in a depository that is defined by the legislature. Well, what about the gold and silver that many Texans hold in their physical possession on their private property or in a safe deposit box not defined as a precious metal depository by the legislature? Will the government attempt to criminalize private ownership of gold again, like they did in 1933 with the executive order from President Roosevelt, and again forbid the possession of monetary gold by any individual, partnership, association, or corporation? The 1933 order was justified on the grounds that hard times had caused hoarding of gold, stalling economic growth, and making the depression worse. People were given three weeks to turn in their gold, otherwise pay a fine that's equivalent to $250,000 today, and or go to jail for 10 years for one ounce of gold, which happened to be the minimum punishment for bank robbery at the time. If you robbed a bank, you could get 10 years, and failure to turn in your gold could get you 10 years. So my question is, would I be granting government power to repeal or to repeat another 1933 grand heist of personal property by voting for Proposition 9? And for your information, the enabling legislation for this proposition defines in statute precious metal as a metal including gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium that A, bears a high value to weight relative weight ratio relative to common industrial metals and customarily is formed into bullion or specie. Specie is defined as a precious metal stamped into coins of uniform shape, size, design, content, and purity suitable for or customarily used as currency and a medium of exchange. Likewise, precious metal depository is defined as a depository that a is primarily engaged in the business of providing precious metal storage to the general public and maintains sufficient insurance to cover precious metal deposited in the depository. However, the legislature can change these definitions down the road through statute. But my question is, are you in the business of providing insurance to store your precious metals under your mattress? How about in your home safe? How about your bank down the street where you might place your silver eagles that your grandpa gave you for Christmas years ago? Since your home doesn't qualify as an acceptable depository, your bullion may be subject to a property tax, just like your school taxes. Advocates of Prop Proposition 9 claim that this amendment will increase chances that the Texas Depository could join COMEX, which is a division of the New York Mercantile Exchange that trades futures in metals such as gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Well, that's all good and fine. But the problem, though, is that the enabling legislation, House Bill 2859, states that a person must apply for the exemption with their appraisal district. In other words, I must register my possession of precious metals with the government. What could go wrong there? Why didn't the bill author change the text in the tax code to specifically prohibit the taxation and registration of my bullion not held in an uh, approved depository? 
As shown on the uh, left side of the screen, Proposition 9 passed in the House 140 to 5. In the Senate, it passed 27 to 4. On the right side of the screen are the nay votes on the enabling legislation, six no votes in the House and four in the Senate. Is it constitutional? Yes, precious metals have historically been the most popular form of legal tender and mere possession of legal tender is not subject to a property tax. Is there a need? No, the possession of bullion and precious metals are not currently taxable. Where is the threat that it will be in the future, or is this amendment opening that door? Why did they propose to change the Constitution to say, the legislature by general law may exempt precious metals from taxation? Why not the legislature shall not tax precious metals? To the discerning Texan, this smells of government conspiracy, especially when you consider our history. Is it affordable? Well, if the state ever passes law, the precious metals not held in an approved state bullion depository shall be taxed, then no, Proposition 9 is not affordable, nor is it just. Proposition 10. The constitutional amendment to allow the transfer of a law enforcement animal to a qualified caretaker in certain circumstances. This is the new proposed language in the Texas Constitution. Article 3 of the Texas Constitution, Section 521, will read, The legislature may authorize a state agency or a county, a municipality, or other political subdivision to transfer a law enforcement dog, horse, or other animal to the animal's handler or another qualified caretaker for no consideration on the animal's retirement or at another time if the transfer is in the animal's best interest. Texas law enforcement agencies use dogs, horses, and other animals to help them perform their duties. When these animals retire, agencies typically adopt them to their former handler or another qualified caretaker, usually for a small fee or no fee at all. Texas law classifies domestic animals as personal property and can classify these animals as salvage or surplus property and generally anticipates that a county will auction off its salvage or surplus property and receive a fee. Prop 10 would permit the transfer of a law enforcement animal to the animal's handler or other qualified caretaker for no monetary consideration on the animal's retirement or at another time. And the head of a law enforcement agency makes the final determination and appointment of the caretaker for the animal's retirement. Both the proposed amendment and Senate Bill 2100, the enabling legislation, passed unanimously in both chambers. Senate Bill 2100 was written so that it was not dependent on voter approval of the corresponding Constitution amendment. Hence, the Texas statutes have already been amended and they are current law, which became effective the middle of May of this year, 2019, meaning that this is not necessary as a Constitution amendment. Even if the Constitution amendment fails to pass in November, which it won't, the statutes have already set the legislative intent in motion. This proposed amendment is the simplest to understand and a good example of a feel-good puppy dog amendment. Anybody with warm blood in their veins will like this amendment and vote for it because who can vote against puppy dogs? Is it constitutional? Yes, a law enforcement animal is the property of the government and upon retirement deserves humane treatment. However, it's not required as a constitution amendment. Is there a need? Well, people in general don't benefit from this amendment, but the animal and his trainer certainly do. And as I stated, the enabling legislation is already effective and this amendment is not necessary, so there's really not a need. Is it affordable? Yes, there is no cost to government, only to the caretaker, because the enabling legislation puts the monetary burden to care for these animals on the assuming caretaker. So, if you weren't able to keep up with me, and how your two state legislators voted. You can find that information by reading my article on these 10 proposed amendments. That article is at www.ntcl.org. It is my hope that you will contact your legislators and ask them why they voted the way they did. Let them know that you are watching what they're doing. Uh, in my article listed here, you will also find links to the actual text of the proposed amendments and the enabling legislation and like I said the votes will also be there also. Thank you for being involved in your government. God bless Texas.